So I've been talking about uh, for years uh, the importance of uh, what I call creating a wow factor in your church. And, and I had a, a, a guy come up to me. I did this seminar in a, in a state uh, six, seven years ago, not long after I came to, to then Home Missions, North American Ministries. And um, I went to, to this uh, particular state and I did this seminar, or the old version of it, um, I had to create a wow factor. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, he said, you know, I said, when I heard what you were speaking, I said, I didn't like that title. He said, it really kind of offended me. He said, we don't need a wow factor in our church. He said, we need God in our church. He said, but after I listened to it, he said, it was, it was better than, than what I expected. So I was like, well, I'm glad it was better than what you expected. But, but um, so I've been talking about a wow factor. But really what I mean by that when I say that is that if, if, if a guest, if, a, if a, somebody that has no connection to your church, that just lives in your community or whatever, if they decide for whatever reason on one particular Sunday, they're going to attend church and they show up at your church, you need to make sure that you're doing something to exceed their expectations of what you know, they're expecting when they come to church so that you have a good chance of getting them back for a second visit and then a third visit. Because every time they come back, they're going to hear the gospel, hopefully, and they're going to have an opportunity to be introduced to Jesus. And so I just am a firm believer that we need to do everything, and you'll hear this throughout this seminar, but everything we do should be with excellence. And so we should do the very best that we possibly can do um, in our church, which goes back, I used to have a bunch of stuff about, you know, creating, you know, uh, uh, excellence in our in our setting where, you know, making sure that that the building looks good and all that. I'm not going in all that stuff now because I've, like I said, I've changed a lot of the content of this. And there's there's one main thing that we're going to really camp out on. And I really want to talk the most about. uh, And it's the one thing that your church must change. uh, But it still has to do with all of this uh, wow factor that we're talking about. But there's a lot of things that we have to make sure that we do in our churches, like improve our facilities, make sure that our people are trained, make sure that our greeters know um, how to, you know, take a, a first time guest and, and get their kids to the nursery, get them to the coffee station or get them to the restroom or whatever they need to do uh, with, with, you know, the best way possible to make it a good experience and, and all of that. We need to make sure that our programming is the very best that it possibly uh, can be and, and all of that. But that's not really what the main purpose of all of this is. I mean, the main purpose that we do all of that is so that people can hear the message of the gospel. Because if people are so concerned with, are my kids being taken care of? Or I can't believe this church looks like this or distracted by, you know, poor programming or by, you know, people not having a, a plan or whatever, that's going to detract away from the gospel. And so we need to make sure that we do everything we possibly can do to help introduce people uh, to the gospel. And let me just kind of clarify this because I think that that you'll understand this a little bit more when we when we kind of get through this first uh, section here but but I, w- I want to talk about preparing uh, for the post church now what I mean by that is you hear a lot of terms okay there's a lot of terms like you know we hear church growth people talk about or or we Tom Rayner has even mentioned this stuff before and and all that we hear things like the modern era the postmodern era the, the, the post-Christian era, what does all of that stuff really mean? Or what does it really have to do with the church in America today? Well, I believe it's very important that we understand this stuff because it does have a lot to do with the church in America today. But the modern era, of course, is generally understood to be uh, around the turn of the, uh, the, the, the 1900s, uh, which basically there was uh, just an acceptance for absolute truth. In other words, you know, I don't think any of us were around in 1900, but even in my generation, I was born in the early 1960s, 1962 to be exact. Um, I'm 58, save you from doing the math. Uh, But um, uh, even in my generation growing up, people believed in truth. I mean, there was right and wrong. My parents taught me the difference between right and wrong. That was the modern era. Okay, that's because there was just absolute truth. People understood that there is absolute truth. There are certain things that are right 
and there are certain things that are wrong. It's that simple. It's that easy. It was the modern era. But then the postmodern era is described as the time whenever truth became relative. In other words, there were some that would argue, oh, no, no, no. There's not some things that are right and some things that are wrong. Now, something that may be right for you may be wrong for me, or something that's wrong for me, right for me, might be wrong for you. And so we, we, we got into that in the postmodern era, right? As long as I'm not hurting anyone else, I can do whatever I want to do. And so that's postmodern thinking. And so I put that in the context of the gospel for just a moment, and let's think about how do we deal with those two separate issues when it comes to dealing with the spiritual issues that people have in their lives, okay? So if a person believes in absolute truth, then it means something to say, thus saith the Lord, this is right, this is wrong, compared to someone who doesn't believe in absolute truth. And thus saith the Lord just means God's narrow-minded and mean and judgmental. Okay, you following me? This is important stuff, and we're going to break all this down a little bit as we talk about this. No one really knows when the shift was made from the modern to the postmodern era, but we definitely know today we are living in a postmodern era because there is no acceptance anymore of absolute truth. In the modern era, there were a basic understanding and tolerance for religion, for the church, for authority. You look at the news, it doesn't take two minutes to watch the news today to realize we have no respect for authority. That's gone. There's, there's no respect for religion, whatever religion it might be. I mean, I, obviously I'm a Christian, so I mean, I'm going to say the Bible. But for whatever it is, there's no acceptance of, of anything that, that makes somebody choose a path. They want all these different options. Okay, that's the postmodern era. Now, all this is important, so just hang with me for a couple minutes. We're going to get there uh, in, in just a minute. And so today there's no tolerance for the church, religious things, the Bible. Um, all of that is gone. In fact, 48% of Americans qualify as post-church, which means they know about Christianity, but they just choose not to participate in any form. That's, a, that's half, okay? So they, they still, there's still enough of it around, that the influence around people know it, but they just choose not to be involved in it. So people have changed, and I believe that is something that we have to realize and understand um, in our approach to how we do ministry today. And there's one thing, there's one thing that I believe that every church has to change if we are going to reach a post-modern, post-Christian culture that we are called to serve and that we are called to minister to and that we are called to win through the gospel. There's one thing that we must do. Are you ready? Have I built it up enough? It's like, okay, we're going to go to commercial break now. No, I'm just kidding. There's one thing that we have to change. It's everything. That's it. Everything. Everything. It's not our worship music. It's not how we dress on Sunday morning. It's not the version of the Bible we use. It's not any one particular thing that you can pick out. It is everything. We have to realize that in the church today, if we're doing anything like we did a generation ago, we're behind. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying we need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't stop doing things that are working. If you're reaching people, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that when it comes to our thinking about how we do ministry today, we need to be willing to say, am I really willing to look at this stuff? Or is the tradition more important than the outcome? And so we've been hearing that kind of said in different ways over this uh, conference the last couple of days. But I talked about how the people have changed. And what that means is as people have changed, our culture has changed. And so if the church isn't willing to make some important changes, then we are not going to be able to reach the people of the culture today. You say, well, I don't know if people really have changed that much. Let's think about that for a minute. I think this is pretty fun to do. Um, 
I'm getting behind in my PowerPoint, but because I'm going here too, getting a little passionate about some of this. But anyway, so people have changed, right? People have changed. Um, in the 1950s, and I read this somewhere, and it's been too long ago, I don't remember, I didn't cite it, so it's like most statistics, you know, 75% of all statistics are made up anyway, so it doesn't matter, but, but um, this, I read this, 1950s, major high school offenses were smoking in the bathrooms, chewing gum, cutting class, and smooching in the parking lot. That was the major offenses, 1950. Have you thought about what that's like today for teenagers in high school, the things that they are faced with? Alcohol and drug addiction, sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, sexual orientation, take that a step further, gender, gender identity. I mean, we, it, it's been long enough now that we don't think about it every day, but who would have thought just a couple of years ago we were debating bathroom laws in schools of gender. Who, who, it's not something I can even fathom in my mind that we're going to have to deal with this stuff, but I'm, our teenagers, our kids are living through this stuff every single day of their lives. I didn't face that stuff. If I'd have walked in the girls' bathroom when I was in high school, I would have been sent to the principal's office and I'd have gotten in trouble. That's not the case today because we have all this, you know, stuff going on. In the 1960s, the unchurched person, the unchurched person in America, they still believed in the deity of Christ. They may not have been able to really, you know, exegete it, explain it, talk about it, but they believed in it. They believed in absolute truth. Their parents taught them the difference between right and wrong. In the 1960s, even unchurched people in America trusted the Bible. They had a positive image of the church and the pastor. They had a bi basic knowledge of biblical stories and narratives. And I've told this story many, many, many times across this country when I've spoken at all different kinds of events. But I was visiting with a, a young lady in her 20s just a few years ago. She was from, from southern, central southern Illinois. Grew up there her whole life. And I was talking to her about, I was witnessing to her, and I said something about her church background. I asked her if she, if she you know, grew up in church, and she said no. And I said, well, you know, did you, did you have a, a church that you kind of, you know, called a home church or whatever? She said no. She said, in fact, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've ever been inside of a church in my life. It's a girl in her 20s, grew up in central Illinois, in the United States of America. And the place isn't important, but it is important because it could be anywhere in America that this story could come from. And so then after I talked to her for a little while, I found out that, that she had gone to the very few times that she'd been to church her entire life was with her grandmother, who was a Jehovah's Witness. And so this young lady in central Illinois, in the United States of America, in her 20s, had never one time been to an evangelical, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Never once. She'd never heard the gospel. And panic came over me. I still remember this feeling. Because I thought, what in the world do I say to her? It's not the two diagnostic questions I learned when I was trained in evangelism explosion in the 1980s. Those questions didn't work. It didn't matter if she thought she was going to go to heaven or what God would say if he was to ask her, why should I let you in heaven? She didn't know. People have changed. It, it, people are so different that we have to realize and understand that they don't believe these things. There is no trustworthiness of the Bible. There's no positive image of the church. Man, we can amen that, right? I mean, we hear most of the stuff we hear about the church and the media and the news today is bad. There's not even a basic belief in right or wrong. And so how in the world do we deal with this today? That's why I say everything has to change. Here's a slide, and I wish you could see this better. And I apologize. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be this large of a room, this small of a screen. Or I would have printed this off for you or something. But in the 1970s, there was a, 
a guy that developed this Engel uh, scale of evangelism uh, or Engel scale uh, steps to Christ. And if you, you can Google Engel, E-N-G-E-L scale, Engel scale of evangelism, and you can pull this up. But I want to just talk about this for, for a few minutes because it, it's very important for us to realize and understand. And I know you can't see this very well, but basically there's a line graph or a, or a, a stair, step graph here. And zero on this angle scale of evangelism is the decision to follow or trust Christ. Okay, the decision is, so that's where zero is. And so negative one is uh, they accept the implications of becoming a Christian. Or let me start at the bottom, because that would make more sense. I think negative nine would be no awareness of God. They have no awareness whatsoever. So they're a negative nine. A negative eight would be they have some awareness of God. Negative seven, contact with Christians. Negative six, interest in Jesus. Negative five, investigating Jesus. Negative four, grasp truth about Jesus. Negative three, understanding implications of truth about Jesus. Negative two, acceptance of Christian truth. Negative one, accept uh, the implications of becoming a Christian. And then zero is where they trust Christ. It's a decision to surrender. Then you start on the positive side of the scale, um, gain confidence in their decision, experience life change, learn basics of faith, uh, learn dis disciplines, share with others, ongoing growth. Okay, so you understand kind of the separation. So let me just ask you some questions about this that I want us to, to really think about when it comes to how we present the gospel, how we talk to people today uh, about salvation, about faith in Christ. In the 1960s or in the 1950s, where would people start out on this scale? I think they would start out somewhere probably negative two or three, probably, in, in 1950s, 1960s. And that's relative. It could be, I know it could, could vary, but let's just say negative two or three. So if you are approaching someone about the gospel and they are at a negative two or a negative three, your conversation is going to be completely different than if they're a negative nine or if they're a negative eight. I mean, they, in America, they're going to have some awareness of God, probably. So they're going to be around a negative eight or a negative seven where they have contact with Christians. But an interest in Jesus? What do we hear all the time? We are living in a very spiritual time. People are interested in spiritual things. Well, what does that mean? Spiritual things could be the occult. It could be, uh, you know, exercise, yoga, and, and meditation. I mean, it could be so many different things. It doesn't mean that they're interested in Jesus. Okay, don't let that confuse you. And so the conversation that you would have with a person that's a negative six or seven is totally different than the conversation that you would have with someone who's a negative two or negative three. Okay, I think you understand my point. I'm not going to belabor that. And so that goes back to what I mentioned to you a moment ago. Uh, I was trained in evangelism starting in college, my days back at Hillsdale uh, in 1980 uh, when I first went to college in Oklahoma. And we had evangelism explosion class there. We used James Kennedy's book, Evangelism Explosion. Uh, I went on st staff at Grace Free Baptist Church in Oklahoma City where I taught evangelism classes. So I was the leader of our evangelism program. We had the evangelism uh, program that we used EE. And we did the training and we had, you know, Tuesday nights, we had everybody come together. We do all the homework. We do all the memorization. We do all the program, 16 weeks. And we would go out and we would witness to people. We'd do, you know, the cold turkey knocking on doors. We'd go to the mall. We'd go to a park. We'd go to a, wherever we could go and find people. And, and we just asked the two diagnostic questions. We'd present the gospel if they'd let us. We'd ask them to, to surrender to Christ. We'd do the immediate follow-up. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody? You all know evangelism explosion? And, and it's great stuff. I still use grace, man, God, Christ, faith. I still use that today. It's a good outline. But the thing is, as you talk about grace to somebody differently if they're a negative two than if they're a negative seven. You talk about God in a different way to someone who's a negative two than if they're a negative seven. You talk about man or about faith or, or whatever. And so it's just... It's so different. So that's why I say, what is something, what's the one thing your church has to change? It's everything. It's how we do 
everything in our church. It starts out with the way we do evangelism. Boy, I could get myself in trouble here. <clears throat> this is, like I said, I updated this stuff and some of this is new content. I'd like to go somewhere with this. I better not say it, but um, we, we just need to rethink how we do evangelism. What that means on Sunday morning. Have you seen a note? Have you noticed a difference? And i taking COVID out of the situation because this is all weird. I know nobody can, you know, with COVID, everything's changed again. But have you noticed how people respond today? Is it different than how they responded 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? It has been in my observation, in my context, in churches that I've been at, I see, I see a big difference in how people respond to different things. And so the way we do evangelism, I remember one time when I was pastoring, my, my world was shook when I went to visit this old guy who um, his wife came to our church, but he never came. And um, I went to visit him at his house and, and we, we built, began building a relationship. He was, he was a really nice guy. And, and although we had probably 40 years difference in our ages, maybe more than that, um, we just hit it off. And we just developed a friendship. And I, st I would go out to his house on a regular basis and just sit down and we'd just visit. And the opportunity came over time. And this was not intentional. Believe me, I'm not saying this was how I planned it out because this is not how I planned it out. I tried the whole presenting the gospel to him the way I knew how and all that. And it was always like, well, preacher, you can stop right there. I'm not interested. I know how you feel about things, and I, that, that's okay, but this, we're not gonna, I, don't, I don't want to talk about that right now. He wouldn't talk about it. And so as time went on and as we began developing this relationship, one day I come over to his house and I notice a Bible laying on the floor next to his recliner. His name was JC, and I said, JC, you've been reading the Bible? Yeah, I have, preacher. He said, ever since I asked Jesus to come into my heart, I thought it was pretty important for me to read the Bible. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold it, hold it, back up. What did you say? He said, when I invited Jesus to come into my life, when I, when I got saved, I don't remember what exact terminology he used, probably didn't say got saved, but I said, well, when, when did that happen? He said, well, it's, it's kind of been a process over, oh, no, 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 no. You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, then you're saved. This is no, there's no process to this. He's like, well, yeah, it was a process for me. I had to really kind of understand. And so, I mean, I, we went into this lengthy discussion and it rocked my whole theological world because I do still believe that you confess with your mouth and you're saved. I believe that. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. It's, a, it's an act. I get that. But for JC and for a lot of people in our culture today, evangelism is more of a process than it is an event. Now, don't throw tomatoes. You understand? I mean, I clarified that, what, I'm, what I mean by that. And so we just have to realize that, that the way we do evangelism needs to change. We can't just depend on the way we've always done it for the sake of that's the way we've always done it and that's the way we're going to continue to do it, whether it's working or not. And I think the greatest test is ask yourself, how many people have we seen come to Christ in the last year, two years, five years? If that number is zero or very few, maybe you need to look at how you're doing evangelism. Maybe we need to change some things when it comes to evangelism. Another big one is the way we disciple. And again, I, I kind of bragged on Jeff Jones a little bit in his seminar this morning. He did a great seminar on discipleship and about discipleship groups. And I've always been, you know, I felt like discipling people are very important. And, and uh, I've done different things over the years. I've used the, 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 the 12 lessons that home missions you know did years and years ago i used that for years and a lot of different things that that i've developed myself and others have developed uh to help disciple people i used to when i would have somebody in my church that was a new christian i'd go to their home and sit down with them we'd do bible study together for for three or four weeks and then we try to get them into sunday school class and then later as things as the church began to grow and all that we started doing new things to 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 help uh, develop and disciple people but today, that is going to be completely different than it was 20 years ago on how we disciple people because we need to disciple people starting where they are. There may be somebody that puts their faith in Christ. They don't even know the story of Jonah and the whale or David and Goliath 
or any of the children's stories that we take for granted that we think everybody knows. That 20 something year old girl that I mentioned earlier that I was talking to you about from Illinois. Part of that conversation was I asked her, I said, so do you, do you know the story of, of David and Goliath? She said, well, I've, I've heard of it, but I couldn't tell it to you. And I said, Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the great fish or the flood, I know heard of them, but I don't, don't have any idea what, what they really are. I couldn't tell them to you. And so somebody that's at that point in their life, we have to disciple them completely different than somebody that went to church for years as a child or, or whatever, but never made a profession of faith. And so we have to, the way we disciple people is going to be completely different. Back in the olden days when we, was, we were doing evangelism explosion, we did an immediate follow up and then we tried to get people in, you know, to, get, to come to our church and we tried to get them plugged into Sunday school. In fact, that was kind of our next step at our church was we enrolled them in Sunday school and we you know, tried to get them to, to come to, to that. But the way we did discipleship 20, 30, 40 years ago is not the way we should do discipleship today. It's completely different. It's got to change. The way we do ministry in general, the things that <clears throat> were once important in our church may not be important today. Let me say that again. The things that may have been important in our church a few years ago may not be important today. Mm-hmm. Now, that's hard. That's hard for somebody even my age. I know I'm not, well, some people would say I'm old, but I don't, I don't feel that old, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting up there quick. I remember the days when I used to go to these kinds of meetings and I'd look around and think, man, I'm the youngest person here. I wish that was true now. I'm with you. But, there you go. But there's some things that are just near and dear to my heart, and I love the way we do certain things in the church, and because I've been around long enough, to, there's just things that, that I love doing. There are certain things that I love, you know, as t- traditions and, and certain things that are, that are just great. But if they're not effective today, why are we still doing it? You know, there's really very few things outside of the word, prayer, fellowship, service, the ordinances, very few things out of a very small cluster of things that are absolute must-haves or must-dos in the church today. Most of it is tradition. Whether it's tradition from the 1950s or the 80s or the 2000s or whatever, I remember reading an article back a number of years ago about that the uproar it caused in the church when they introduced the organ for worship. (laughs) Because the organ was used in the melodramatic theater, and it was a tool of Satan. And there was an uprising in the church when the organ was introduced as an instrument for worship. Much like many of us lived through with drums or guitars in worship in the 90s or whatever, whenever that was. And so the truth of the matter is, is that most of that stuff doesn't matter to any of us anymore. We've got past all that. And there's a whole new set of things from projecting things on the screen or the wall or singing out of a hymn book or, you know, a lot of stuff that, that really, when it, when it really comes down to truth, and this is hard for some of us to accept, I get it. I'm a child of the 60s. I understand. But it all, most of it, except for those very few things, are preferences and tradition. And so I heard a guy one time was listening to a podcast and he said, he said, our church staff, and this was a, I don't even remember who it was now, but it was a mega church pastor or something I was listening to. And I was working on a house. I still remember when I heard it, uh, I was working on an old rent house I had. But he said, our staff sat down and he said, our church staff, he said, we made the conscious decision that we're willing to do anything that's not immoral or illegal or sinful, whatever, the exact things, I don't remember, but things like that, we're we're willing to do anything that's not illegal, immoral, or sinful to reach people with the gospel. And I had to think about that for a minute. I thought, am I willing to say that? Am I I really willing to say that? I was pastoring at the time, and I asked myself, am I willing to say that? Because there's some stuff that I like a whole lot that I don't want to give up. Many of you may know the name Delbert Aiken, and I'm going to close with this. He was a preacher in Oklahoma where I served for 33 years. Delbert was a 
very traditional pastor. I mean, an older guy, sang with the minister's quartet for years, Southern gospel. I mean, just a, you know, very old-fashioned, traditional guy. And he went to a very, probably at that time, the most modern, contemporary church we had in our entire denomination. And I remember he, I was talking to him one day, and he said, I hate our music at our church. I hate it. He said, they turn the lights down. It's dark in there. They turn up the music. It's so loud. I hate it. And I said, Delbert, I said, why do you stay there? Why do you, why do you go to church there? And this is what he said in my words. I don't remember exactly. I wish I knew exactly what he said because it was way better than I can say it. But he said, because when I'm standing there looking through the dark, he did say that. I remember that. He said, I'm standing there looking through the dark, and I see all those young people and all the people that our church has won to Christ. And I have to remind myself it's not about what I like. Mic drop. That's all you have to say. But the question comes back to us as leaders, as pastors. Are we willing to say that? Are we willing to change everything, even if it's something we like, or if it's something that we prefer, or if it's something that, that we want to do, if it's not effective, or if it's not reaching people, are we really willing to change it? And I think that's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. We have to grapple with and we have to figure it out. Now, again, I'm not advocating, I'm not saying anything about doing anything that's against your conscience or against, you know, any kind of biblical standard or moral or belief that you have. I'm not, please don't misunderstand in any form that I'm even alluding to that. I'm not. But I'm saying that in our practice of most things in the church that are preference or tradition, if it's not working, we need to change it because we're dealing with a different culture of people today that we've never dealt with before. And, and let me just tell you this and throw a little monkey wrench into this whole thing. It's gonna be different when we come out of this pandemic. People have changed through the COVID pandemic. It's gonna change culture. And I don't know what that's gonna look like yet. None of us do, but I think people have gotten a lot more apathetic People have gotten a lot more just kind of, you know, complacent in their attitude about going to church. Hey, I kind of like this watching church online thing. I can do it in my pajamas and I can go get me a bowl of cereal while it's on and nobody knows. And I, I mean, I, I'm just assuming because that's kind of some of the things I liked whenever I was, you know, when we were doing ours online. Uh, and, and so we may not ever be back to what it was pre-COVID. And we may have to figure a lot of this stuff out again, but it's all the more to say why this is so important for us to really begin thinking about this now because what if it is something that is near and dear to your heart or whatever if, if it's tradition or a preference or whatever we have to be willing to change whatever we can do to reach people with the gospel